The SUNY College of Environmental Science and Forestry, founded in 1911, is now the only institution of higher learning in the United States dedicated solely to the study of natural resources and the environment. Welcome to Improve Your World with SUNY ESF. I'm your host, Dave White. Today, we'll be talking about biodiesel, an alternative fuel that can help reduce our dependence on petroleum to power our motor vehicles. Biodiesel is the name of a clean-burning alternative fuel produced from domestic renewable resources like vegetable oils or animal fats. Biodiesel contains no petroleum, but it can be blended at any level with petroleum diesel to create a biodiesel blend. It can be used in diesel engines with little or no modification. Biodiesel is a simple-to-use product, biodegradable, non-toxic, and essentially free of sulfur and aromatics. ESF student Greg Boyd was the person behind the idea to begin biodiesel production at the college. He wanted to take advantage of the used cooking oil from nearby dining halls. The used cooking oil is now collected from five dining halls on the Syracuse University campus and then converted to biodiesel with equipment installed in a former ESF greenhouse and collected in a portable storage tank until it's used by buses, trucks, and other college vehicles. ESF scientists and students combined forces with the American Dairy Association and Dairy Council and the Onondaga County Resource Recovery Agency to showcase the biodiesel process by using one of the most popular attractions at the New York State Fair, the butter sculpture. The 2008 sculpture was titled the cow jumped over the moon and created by sculptor Jim Victor, his wife Marie Pelton, and their son Matthew. It's based on the children's nursery rhyme and included the dish running away with the spoon. Here was the unveiling ceremony. Thank you so much for coming today. We're excited, as you know, is our 40th anniversary butter sculpture. 40 is the new 30. To my right, we have Dr. Namora from SUNY ESF. Dr. Namora is heading up the team that will be uh, creating the butter from my, the biodiesel for butter process. He can explain that in layman's terms. I can walk my own iPad, so you're welcome to talk to Dr. Namora. So, the butter that you see behind us obviously is in a solid form. And so for us to use it for biofuel production, we're actually going to have to separate this butter into its core components. Now butter itself is made up of sure. fats Absolutely. and proteins and it has water and a little bit of sugars in it. Okay. So we're going to separate out the proteins, the sugars, and the water away from the fats. And we're going to take those fats and we're actually going to use the fats uh, with our bioprocessor that we have on campus and convert that into biodiesel itself. As we speak there, unveiling the butter sculpture, one of the most popular exhibits here throughout the entire state fair. This is extremely exciting because normally a sculpture like this would be thrown away and it goes to waste when we can use it to make a hundred gallons of you know usable diesel fuel which is used in education. It, it's a perfect uh, way to recycle something like fat. It's a shame to, to waste all of this good, great, usable fuel, uh, especially with fuel prices as they are now. So I think the more that we can do to help in that regards, the better. The biodiesel that we create can actually be used in any uh, vehicle that can run on normal petroleum-based diesel. And so <clears throat> essentially we have some buses on campus that are going to be using some of the diesel fuel that we're going to be making from this butter sculpture. This is a great opportunity for SUNY ESF. Uh, like you said, this is the 40th year that they've had the, the butter sculpture, but it's the first year that they're actually going to be able to use it uh, for the fuel production. And so, uh, as a fuel base, normally we use vegetable oils. So this is a unique opportunity for us to expand the types of uh, sources that we can use for the biodiesel. And so this is a great opportunity for us. We're very thankful to the American Dairy Association for giving us this opportunity to convert it into biodiesel. After the 12-day run of the State Fair, ESF students went to work on the 900-pound sculpture. They painstakingly removed the layers of butter from the frame, removed the pieces from the refrigerated showroom, and put them into 55-gallon drums. The drums were sealed, labeled, and trucked back to the ESF campus. When the butter reached the bioprocessing center, ESF graduate student Dan Nicholson and his team melted it down and cleaned it up to begin production. All right, we have the butter in here from the butter sculpture, and we have it being warmed 
by that heating device, and as you can see, the butter is starting to melt around the edges. That is about 200 pounds of butter. I'm going to cover it back up and keep the heat in a little better. We clarified the butter and removed the protein and water, which is not useful for biodiesel making, and separated out the clean oil, which is that bucket contains the uh, proteins, water, and unusable fats. In the reactor is all the good usable oil, or triglyceride. As you can see through the window, it's relatively clear. It's melted butter with a little bit of waste vegetable oil. The clear, clarified oil goes in the reactor. This equipment is the same, and the process is the same as it would be if we were using waste fryer oil from the cafeterias. Um, the clear oil, the good, clean, clear oil would go right into this port, and fill the machine to the proper level, and start the reaction. For oils, like uh, this waste vegetable oil or melted butter, as I showed you earlier, um, inside the reactor, we fractionate those, or uh, um, break those in a chemical reaction into the fatty acids, which make the biodiesel fuel, and a waste product of, of about 10%, which is glycerol, that you can see in this. Can you see the line between the two? That's fuel on the top. Thick, viscous, dark colored glycerol on the bottom. This glycerol is the same glycerin that's um, in many oh, you're fat and body you're products. Uh, only this is a crude glycerin that can't be used in any of, any of those things without a lot of cleaning and purification. This is bright, clean, nice biodiesel that we've made out of waste vegetable oil. Yeah. And the stuff we make out of the butter will look exactly the same. It's a nice, clean fuel. It has a nice, clean odor. Unlike uh, diesel fuel that you buy at the pump, um, this smells good. Do you ever put yourself in your stories? You can say it does smell good. It does smell pretty good. It smells a little bit like really clean olive oil. Now, when you put this biodiesel in the reactor, You get nearly the same mileage and much better exhaust um, pollution characteristics. It cleans up the pollution greatly, especially the soot and uh, particulate matter that comes out and uh, sulfur. There's no sulfur in the biodiesel. So then you want more Yeah, and the exhaust cleans, um, no more black soot, <laughs> and uh, the smell is characteristic of vegetable oil. Do you think with the process that you have going on that, you know, maybe in however many years from now, this will be the norm, people will be, maybe not from butter, but we'll be taking, you know, the byproducts of things and turning it into biodiesel instead of, you know, the regular oil, you know, we will have a pretty more more cars? That's exactly what's happening today. The biodiesel industry is growing dramatically. Um, the capacity in the United States has already reached a billion gallons a year. Um, which has also introduced a problem that we're trying to solve here at ESF. A billion gallons of biodiesel will produce 100 million gallons of glycerol waste. Here at ESF, we're doing a number of great um, research projects on how to use that um, industrial waste for valuable products. Um, we have a great research group working on making biodegradable plastics out of this material. There are other groups that are using it to make um, energy um, and, and other fuels. So. Um, Biodiesel isn't one of the big research projects at ESF, but energy problems in general are a main focus of the college. You might have already said this already, but besides butter, what are some of the other products out there that you can break down and turn into biodiesel? I think the best one is used vegetable oil from restaurants. That's what our project is designed around. Um, we use the waste vegetable oil from Sadler, Haven, um, Shine, and we um, collect that on a regular basis and use it in this reactor in the same procedure that we described to you to make biodiesel. Um, you can also use um, brand new oils, and in fact, that's what most of the industry uses, and that um, explains the huge growth in soybean production and ethanol production all across the world and the United States. That's what biodiesel is made from. Um, 
in the future, a bright, a bright star on the horizon in the future is that we may be able to use algae to produce oils, and that would um, solve a major problem. Uh, algae can produce a great deal of oil based on their weight. They can um, be grown in shallow water ponds, and they can also be used to capture or collect or sequester carbon dioxide from smokestacks of factories. Um, that would actually be the food that the algae would eat to make the oil. So it's a great potential project, and that's what many people are, are researching right now. Like I said, we have the capacity to make um, a billion gallons. We're not making that much, but we have the capacity. We've already replaced about 2% of our diesel consumption with homemade biodiesel, American-made biodiesel. Um, whether that um, capacity will reach even higher depends on farming techniques um, and, a, and a fundamental shift in the way we grow and process um, agricultural materials. But we're on our way, and it's, it's looking good. The recipe is 50 gallons of oil to 10 gallons of methanol, sodium hydroxide, and sulfuric acid. Start the reactor and then add sulfuric acid. The sulfuric acid is used to neutralize any fatty acids that are made in the cooking process for used oils or butter. Uh, the reaction that's happening right now, what's called the transesterification reaction, will take overnight. Uh, tomorrow, we'll separate the two fractions, the biodiesel from the glycerol, uh, dispose of the glycerol, and wash the fuel with water. That takes another day. So the entire process from start to finish takes about two days. Then, test it out. Pour the butter turned into biodiesel in a vehicle and see how it runs. The mileage is nearly the same as petroleum diesel. It's a little bit less. But the, what, the equivalent of octane is a little bit higher. So you get um, better wear on the motor. And it works fine. So biodiesel, even biodiesel made from butter, works. But where does biodiesel fit into the development of alternative energy? We put that question to Dr. Edwin White, director of the SUNY Center for Sustainable and Renewable Energy. Where does biodiesel fit into it? Dave, that's a, that's a good question because it's uh, most of the effort at the federal level and the state levels have been on uh, gasoline, obviously because that's one of our big issues in the country is uh, getting off of Mideast oil. But biodiesel is one of the other alternative fuels that certainly has a, a market share and a, and a place to operate in the country, particularly in our uh, trucking industry and with our farm community and the kinds of vehicles we use in those places. So it does have a role. Yeah, we, I mean, you think about it, there's an awful lot of uh, vehicles out there between uh, trucks that are transporting goods to uh, uh, heavy-duty trucks that are doing plowing and uh, things like that, or even uh, heavy machinery is, uh, uh, you know, all runs on diesel fuel. All right, I think that's true, but one of the issues may well be that uh, gasoline drives the rest of our vehicles, and the gasoline market is, is hundreds of times bigger than the biodiesel market. We're estimating we use about 160 billion gallons of gasoline a year in the country, and I believe the biodiesel market may be maybe a billion gallons. So that puts it a little bit in perspective, but at the same time, if you're using it and going green and helping with greenhouse gases and climate change and the issues we deal with, and also the fact that we do make it out of oil, you know, from imports, then it does help to, to deal with biodiesel in the country. Is, <laughs> what about, um, just go the other direction for a second, and uh, getting uh, mm -hmm. automobiles to switch over to diesel engines. Yeah. There's a large number of them that already do that. There, there are, there are, but at the same time, I don't think you're going to see us uh, go that direction in, in much of a direction that way, because Detroit, General Motors, Chrysler, Ford are all dealing now with funds from the federal government to deal with uh, E85 vehicles, alternative fuel, uh, flex fuel vehicles that are all on the alcohol fuels, not the biodiesel. You know, biodiesel bio is, is fine, but I think you're going to see more electric-powered cars, you know, alternative vehicles that direction than biodiesel. The diesel will still stay with the transportation industry and the big trucks and probably the farming equipment and that kind of stuff. Okay, I can't right. let it go right. without one more question right. about diesel. And that, the, the, uh, because uh, a diesel mm -hmm. uh, is, is considered a, uh, or a better engine, uh, mm -hmm. and it's used in a lot of the vehicles that mm -hmm. are produced for the European overseas mm -hmm. market. Well, it is, and we sell a lot of uh, biodiesel in, in uh, Europe. In fact, we had a uh, law just passed a very little while ago that you cannot bring in oils from, say, Indonesia, make biodiesel here in the United States, and then sell it and get the tax credits and things in the States. And we were doing that with some loopholes in the federal law that were allowing companies to actually do that. So we we're producing a lot of biodiesel but shipping it to Europe, where it is in much more in demand in Europe than it is here in the United States. It's, 
All right. So given <laughs> its share of the market, <laughs> diesel, and then they're then switching to or using biodiesel to help supplement that and reduce the the use of the the, the amount of petroleum that's used uh, to uh, in the in the diesel products, I guess the answer is that diesel biodiesel is a worthwhile uh, part of the solution to the uh, energy problem. It certainly is, and and it will be. It'll it'll be all the way from the feedstock production with the farmers and the income they can make to the infrastructure to transport it to the uh, vehicles that util utilize it in, the, in their production. So it's, it's there, it's part of, part of the mix. It, it's not the big part of the mix, but it is, it is a very serious component of the mix in alternative fuels that this country needs to go to. The, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, the production of uh, biodiesel, uh, what's it made <laughs> from now? Actually now it's made mostly from soybeans and uh, palm oil and uh, crops that are grown especially for that. And so these are crops that uh, were used in other directions possibly, but uh, there are opportunities for waste oils and uh, food oils and those kind of directions to go. But right now it's mostly made from agricultural crops, and soybeans is the biggest one in the country right now. Does that present mm -hmm. a similar type problem uh, that is faced in the ethanol mm -hmm. industry, mm -hmm. making ethanol from corn, taking mm -hmm. corn away mm -hmm. from feedstock mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and, and you know, using it for fuel? There's certainly a perception it does, but I really think that's probably a myth more than a reality. You know, almost, uh, you know, in, in the corn, we, we use about 60% of the corn crop last year to make ethanol. We export about 20% of the corn crop, and the rest is used for other products in the country. And so it's the, right, the use right. of corn for ethanol is not really uh, uh, hurting the, the, the food supplies? Well, I, I, it could, but I don't think it is directly in terms of making a major impact right now. And there's always a talk about uh, the cost of it going up in that direction because you're competing in terms of cost. But in reality, the cost of our ag production is mostly based upon energy and fertilizer inputs in that direction, not upon the feedstock itself and whatever. And I think you'll find that, uh, you know, biodiesel's fine, you know, and biodiesel's good. The state of Minnesota had a mandate a couple years ago of 2% uh, biodiesel in all of their farm equipment. And they backed off from that a little bit because they had a little trouble with uh, the biodiesel in the cold weather. And they also had some trouble in quality manufacturing. It's, uh, we simply need the regs and the oversight to be able to produce very high quality biodiesel. And that's well developed within the diesel industry, and it's well developed in the gasoline industry. But as you start looking at alternative fuels and getting startup companies and people going, sometimes the chemistry and the production facilities aren't as good as they should be. And so we've had some difficulties of getting some poor materials into the market. And as soon as that happens, people back off from it. And so you've got to deal with a quality control issue as well. And that's a regulatory issue and an oversight issue and go from there. Now, right. diesel, uh, uh, but, uh, for years I can remember uh, uh, you know, the diesel trucks having to be left running all night long in very cold weather right. because you didn't want them seizing up. And, that, uh, and evidently, diesel, regular diesel, has solved that problem, That's an, that, that, that difficulty? They, they've dealt with solving the problem, but there's still a cold weather issue with diesel. And the same thing with biodiesel as well. And biodiesel is a little more difficult than regular diesel is. That, Right. That's what I was right. leading yeah, to, is right. that the, right. then when you go to yeah. biodiesel, you mm -hmm. kind of exacerbate that original problem. But it's simply a materials issue. You know, if they solved it with diesel, they could solve it with biodiesel. And so whatever additives have to be made to uh, make it flexible in cold countries will, will happen. We just haven't had the market draw for that yet. You know, there's a lot of startup companies and a lot of direction to go, but there's still not the big market out there. If you think of a billion gallons of biodiesel being used in a country, that's not a big market compared to 160 billion gallons of gasoline. And so you're still talking subsidies to get it into the marketplace, you know, federal regulations, state regulations. But on top of all that, since we are making diesel out of oil coming into the Middle East, and we're importing, you know, so much of that, and that becomes a security issue for us, it becomes a uh, issue with uh, economic development, it becomes a trade issue, we really need to work on biodiesel and alternative fuels in the country. And so it's, it's homegrown fuel, and that's what... Back to the mm -hmm. grown part, mm -hmm. uh, and we started talking about uh, soybeans, I guess mm -hmm. is one of the major crops. Uh, we mm -hmm. see uh, uh, Morrisville College uh, mm -hmm. getting into mm -hmm. uh, um, planting soybeans uh, mm -hmm. to lead to hopefully biodiesel production, mm -hmm. right. I guess, with a, with a Cortland yeah. firm. Uh, is, so that is a, 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 a realistic and, and um, uh, sensible Oh, I, I think there's, there's, there's no question that we can, we can go other homegrown plants. And right now, soybeans is the way to go in that direction. 
if you happen to go up to the St. Lawrence Valley and uh, travel over towards Toronto, there, there's hundreds of thousands of acres of soybeans in the St. Lawrence Valley heading over. Most of those soybeans now go into food production, but it simply could easily transfer some of that into biodiesel production. The other, the other effort, you mentioned Mooresville, is uh, they're into some fairly large algae projects down there. And there is some, uh, at least basic science information that show you that algae in ponds in water production can produce extreme qualities of oil to make diesel out of biodiesel from. The difficulty is you've, you've got to have what, warm weather, you've got to have sunlight, and you've got to, if it's open ponds, you've got to keep them from becoming contaminated. And the ones in the southwest, for example, where there's, where there's lots of sunlight, but there's not a lot of water, have a problem with dust contamination and other bacteria coming into these open ponds. The ones at Morrisville are closed containers and they're kept from being contaminated, but we have, certainly have a sunlight problem here in central New York. And at the same time, we have a temperature problem. So you've got to keep them warm during the wintertime if the algae are going to work. It's a biological system. So it, it holds a lot of promise to be able to deal with producing tremendous amounts of oil for various products, including biodiesel. But the technical breakthroughs aren't there yet. The basic science is there. We know they do it, but the technical breakthroughs aren't quite through to make it commercial. The, uh, mm -hmm. uh, the, use, the use of algae would be, uh, mm -hmm. would be a, 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 a great thing because mm -hmm. then you wouldn't have any mm -hmm. uh, 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 loss of uh, mm -hmm. food product at all. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's right. nothing that I know right. of that mm -hmm. is made a, you know, into a food mm -hmm. product from algae. Well, we, we, not, not for the algae we'd use for here. We might make yogurts and things like that, using some bacteria and some algae and stuff like that. But, uh, but I, I don't think that's a problem. But I really, uh, there, there's been some issues on indirect land use changes and opportunities like that. If, in fact, we make a lot of ethanol, then we have to shift some of our land to corn production so we lose the crops from the standpoint of soybeans. And the soybean issue has been forced out into, say, the tropics in Brazil where they clear some of the jungle to grow the soybeans. So that th those issues are, are prevalent out there. How real they are is, is a real question but it's easy to raise them and we need to study them. We need to study the whole sustainability of the system. And that's part of what we do here at the college, it's part of what we do with our partnerships, you know, with our industry friends and that, is looking at the total sustainability. If we'd have done that maybe 100 years ago in oil, we might not be in, the, in the, quite the problem we're in with oil right now. Because oil will run out and these renewable biofuels will not run out. I mean, we'll be able to produce what we need. The question mm -hmm. is, is getting things geared mm -hmm. up to a point where there could be a transition mm -hmm. from the petroleum-based mm -hmm. right. economy mm -hmm. to a renewable yeah. energy resource-based economy? Well, it, it's, it's a carbon-limited economy, that's what we're talking about. It's all carbon. And to get it scaled up and to buy down the risk and get the plants going and, and get the people to shift in terms of the cultural shift and that, the paradigm shift, it's going to take more than just science research and, and applied chemistry and applied feedstock production. It's going, to, it's going to take a policy change. It's going to take you know, organizations to buy the risk down for the companies. I mean, you, you can't afford to put 100 million, 200 million, 300 million into a plant that you're not sure the markets are there. So that, that's, that's a federal role, that's a state role, that's an organizational role in terms of those directions. And it's happening. I think we, we, one of the things I've done is work on a uh, federal research and development biomass committee for the last couple of years, uh, giving advice to the undersecretaries of energy and DOE. And we've developed a vision for bioenergy and bioproducts and alternative fuels in the country. They've developed a roadmap of how to get there. And now they have a national biofuels action plan. And biodiesel is part of that action plan. And that's how the country's going to get out of that, out of that uh, way, I believe. Do you think the transition from the Bush administration to the Obama administration is going to change the, the progress on that? I, I think it will. I, th I think uh, we, we had goals set under the Bush administration of 36 billion gallons of ethanol, and we're producing about 6 billion gallons last year from corn. We can probably get to about 14, maybe 15 billion gallons of corn, but we're going to have to shift to other feedstocks. That other feedstock will certainly be cellulosic, you know, getting away from the food chain. It'll be wood-based. It'll be the corn stover. It'll be things other than the food, food chain. The same issues will develop with biodiesel, and I think you'll see us move to the non-food areas of biodiesel in that direction. The oil palms, for example, in Indonesia are uh, non-food. The, the problem with oil palms in Indonesia is that you grow them there, you have to clear rainforest to grow the oil palms, and then import the oil to the United States. That's our issue with Middle East oil right now. We're importing oil to the United States, so we probably should look at our own domestic crops before we look at oil palms from Indonesia, although it's very easy to, to do that. 
Well, when, mm -hmm. one of the things, uh, you know, domestic, uh, the advantages of a domestically grown mm -hmm. is uh, cutting down on the transportation. It's transportation and it's jobs. I mean, there's no, no reason we should not be creating green jobs and dealing with alternative energy and solutions and bioproducts and, and biopower. And I think that's the issue you see that the Obama administration has come forward saying this is jobs creation. It was almost there at the end of the Bush administration. The goals are there, the vision is there, the funding is starting to come down, but there's been sort of a change and it's more integrated now. And hopefully that's where, where we're gonna head because it, it truly is a crisis for the country. Dan Nicholson pointed out that one of the byproducts from the manufacturing of biodiesel is glycerol. And ESF scientists are at work turning that glycerol into a biodegradable plastic. The work is being done in this fermenter where Dr. Jim Nakis leads a team growing bacteria on the biodiesel-derived glycerol to make bioplastic. After five days in the fermentation process, graduate student Wen Young Pan collects a sample to make sure it's ready for the next step. The next step is transferring the material to a centrifuge. The uh, centrifuge is known as a continuous flow centrifuge, and it has the capacity to remove cells from large volumes of liquid containing uh, bacteria or fungi, or whatever it is you're growing. This is a 400 liter fermenter. There's no way you could do the centrifugation in a laboratory, so you need this type of uh, kind of pilot plant or industrial scale continuous flow centrifuge. It's a, it's a rather large uh, stainless steel cylinder inside the cabinet. The uh, liquid comes out of the fermenter, flows into the cylinder, which is spinning at a high rate of speed. The cells get uh, uh, plastered against the inside wall of the cylinder, and they will stay there as kind of a wet paste. And the liquid, which will then flow out the top, uh, uh, will come out this hose and go into the drain. So, so there, there, there should be no cells in the liquid. All the cells will be in the cylinder. Okay. When the centrifuge process is complete, the cylinder is removed and the excess liquid is drained out. Then the cylinder is positioned to harvest the biomass, which looks like coffee ice cream. At this point is we're going to uh, release the uh, top cover to the centrifuge and literally scrape the cells out with, a, uh, with, another, with another implement, kind of a stainless steel scraper and that will harvest the biomass for us and uh, we'll be able to extract the biodegradable polymer from these cells. Yeah. So this That's is the here. edge of the cylinder and all this brown stuff here is all cell mass. The propeller is removed and scraped clean, then the inside of the cylinder is scraped out. This uh, harvested uh, biomass, these bacterial cells, will now be brought back into the laboratory where they, where they will be lyophilized or freeze-dried, uh, which kind of weakens the cells, and uh, then the cells will be exposed to a solvent, and the solvent will, will break apart or, or lyse the cells, and uh, the uh, biodegradable polymer gets released and subsequently is extracted into the solvent phase. And then we go through a few, few more processing and purification steps before we can then deliver that raw polymer to, uh, to companies of interest. Dr. Jim Nakis has two companies willing to test the biodegradable plastic in products for the medical field, such things as plastic covers used for ear exams and thermometer covers, products that can only be used one time and then must be thrown away. This biodegradable plastic will break down in a landfill in about eight weeks. That's it for this edition of Improve Your World with SUNY ESF. Thanks for joining us. Please join us again next time. <music>